So I'm a graduate of 1983, mechanical engineering uh, undergrad at U Lowell. I went on to get my MBA uh, from Riviera University about six years later uh, as part of the night program or evening program. Um, I, my first job out of school was working for what was called Lockheed, then Sanders, and then now it's BAE, and I was an engineer for a few years, but mostly program management. I transitioned into the medical field about 11 years ago and have been in that for 21 years. I've worked for eight companies and six of those startups. Uh, some of them were spin-outs and some, some of them were uh, I helped find, found or I was part of the early management team uh, with those companies. Yeah, so I got back involved with the university about a year and a half ago, two years ago. I started a consulting business and helping uh, startups to get to basically commercialization. So whatever their needs are, whether it be program management, some regulatory strategy, uh, sales and marketing type of activity. So I started doing that about a year and a half ago. And I got re-involved as part of networking with the university and came back to campus, I think, once previous to last year's uh, contest and I was a judge at one of the, the uh, prelim preliminary meetings and then attended the final meeting I was here for the new new uh, engineering manager and everything so it was really good it's been That's good to great. be back on campus I think it's great because it's, it's starting kids off or I shouldn't say kids young adults off very early and looking at options instead of just getting out of school and going to work at a job and not having a chance to be creative I think the, the best time is to do it when you're young and you know have the energy uh, and have the, the, the knowledge and everything and to apply those all together and you know have trying it while you can I think is the best thing yeah so I think the most important thing and I've sort of followed this in my my career path is find something you have passion for that you wake up in the morning you think about and it makes it easy to go to work it makes it easy to go out and raise money it makes it easy to do everything you have to do to be successful so do something you're passionate about and I've pretty much done that on every stop in my career except for one and I kind of not that I regret it but it was a learning experience but it was a totally different experience so so passion it's all, it's all about passion yeah so I, I think it comes back to raising money and you know, as 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 an inventor or as somebody who started a company or a tech or have a technology that's extremely exciting and you have passion for it, what you're going to find is every step of the way you're going to need money to get somewhere with that device, and it, it's not necessarily the funnest thing to do. At times, it can be interesting and can be fun, but for the most part, it's sort of a necessary evil, if you will. But it's the most important part. If you don't have money, you're not going to get anywhere. So, so thank you, everybody, for inviting me here. Um, as mentioned, I started off working for a company that had 100,000 people. I transitioned into the medical space for a company that had 10,000 people. And then I left that company and went to a startup. My first startup, I was a fifth employee, first engineer. Uh, didn't really know much about medical devices at the time. And since that time, I've worked with a total of eight startups. I'm currently doing advisory. So these are just some of the different devices I've worked on, and I don't mean to put these in the gross shell, but some of them can be very simple. This is a silicone, what we call blue egg, kind of obvious. And what happens is when your heart uh, has an infarct, or you have blockage in your heart, part of your heart might die. So this is all dead tissue. And what happens is your heart doesn't beat right anymore. It's supposed to be shaped like a football and rotate. And what happens is it gets, turns into a basketball and it doesn't beat. So one of the techniques they use to fix that problem is they cut the heart down and we put this sizer in and resize the heart and sew it around it. So it's pretty low techy, but it solved a pretty bad, pretty complicated problem for the surgeon. Uh, some of the other some of the other things I work on. Uh, some radio frequency ablation and I apologize for all the acronyms and everything, but so when your heart has what's called atrial fibrillation, <coughs> and one of the techniques to solve that problem is ablate it. You actually put these devices on your heart to burn lines in the heart. It stops the, the uh, from spreading around around. There's 30 million people walking around the world right now with this disease, so it's pretty prominent. You probably see the ads on TV for a couple of drugs that treat atrial fibrillation. Well, this is a surgical way to treat it, and this is actually some shots of in surgery. This is one of those ablation devices ablating a part of the heart, and then inside is actually open heart surgery where they're doing a valve replacement, they're actually going in and ablating too. So I'm yes. going to speak this right on that. Huh? Yeah, so this is what's called the left atrial appendage. Yeah. And it's at the left side of your heart, it's a little appendage, and most people don't know why it's there. But what happens is, uh, if you have atrial fibrillation, you get a thrombus built up in there, and when it fibrillates, it releases a thrombus and stroke. So the leading cause of stroke is due to atrial fibrillation. So this is a technique to, to treat that. And again, it's a really, really big market. Guys already have to worry about this stuff. <laughs> yeah.
So this is a, this is another uh, a bunch of equipment that I invented with uh, actually Dr. Oz. Everybody's heard of Dr. Oz. Oh, yeah. So Dr. Oz was the doctor I worked with many many years ago to develop this. But this is your head would be here, your legs would be here, and this would be opening up your ribs, spreading your ribs open, and actually doing a coronary artery bypass. So if you have blockage, you can go do this. And this is again minimally invasive. Instead of what they usually do is they cut you right up here and spread you wide open. This is a minimally invasive technique for that. And again, it was moderately successful. It was pretty technically driven. It had to have a really good skill set to do it. So it didn't get adopted all that well. I, I, I have to say something, though. That's minimally invasive. <laughs> well, if, you, if you, they take a sternum saw, and when they close your chest back up, they take, take these up, probably 30 gauge wires, and they wrap them, and it's pretty archaic. So take care of your heart. Uh, this is one of the current systems I'm working on. It's, again, very prototype right now. It's a laser, it's a, it's a high-end camera, it has a bunch of optics in it, it actually measures in real time the flow, you can measure the flow in your heart as you're doing these procedures. So, as you can see, I've been kind of focused on heart surgery, cardiology, cardiac surgery, and stuff, and the 21 years I've been at it. So just a little bit of, one, just one quick chart on, a little bit about the market. Uh, by 2019, 20% of the U.S. economy, that's, you know, what the, the generation of, uh, of what the value of the company is, I mean, of, of, the, of, of the country is, 20% of that's going to go into healthcare. So it's a huge amount of investment. And that's even with the Affordable Care Act coming in and trying to manage some of that. Um, it's a growing and aging population. I think you all know that. Uh, and again, uh, 65, people that will be 65 or over will triple to 1.5 billion in the world by 20. So it's a huge, again, market is really exciting. So if you're trying to think about what you want to do when you get out of school or definitely getting into healthcare, either bio or farmer, bio, farmer, medical devices, it's huge. Uh, in the area, there's over 200,000 people employed in that area. Uh, and probably close to half of those are in engineering and some sort of technology. I've heard anywhere from 400 to 600 companies I've ever been able to get my, every report you read, there's a big variation there, but it's a good amount of company, companies that are in this area, that's Massachusetts, our greater Boston area, what they call so southern New Hampshire, up through Worcester, down to the, the southern part of the state. And last year, they awarded three billion dollars worth of uh, NIH, NIH grants to companies in Massachusetts. So a huge amount of money there. That was by far like ten times higher than any other state per capita in, in the country. So there's money to be had if you've got an idea in the medical space or uh, if, you, if you're thinking about it. The other place that I, would, if you're thinking about something to focus on, is, is what's called hospital to home. Many patients are not going to the hospital to be treated for minor things that are being treated at home. And so things like Gianni worked on over the last couple of years and being able to uh, accurately uh, put medicine in people's hands at home and make sure they take the right amount at the right time is very key. So there's all these different mobile apps coming out and all kinds of low techy things that are coming out that are going into that space. And there's a huge amount of money. Um, two of the things that I'm working on right now are related to that space, two of the startups that I'm working with. Uh, have uh, uh, products that are, that are looking at targeting that space. <clears throat> so I just have four quick slides, kind of what I've learned and keys to success if you're thinking about getting into the medical device space. Uh, first one is to protect your idea, and I know there's a, there's a class in a few weeks on intellectual property, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but just my perspective is there's three ways you can protect your ideas. Uh, one is uh, trade secrets. And that would be, and you have to have the very controlled. So, and a lot of software and algorithms are, are treated, uh, are protected with trade secrets. Uh, it's kind of diff difficult to patent the software, so a lot of people just put it in trademarks. And basically, you have to do is anybody that looks at what that is has to sign a non-disclosure. They have a need to know, and you have tight control over that. If you can maintain that, then you can have some. You can maintain that technology so that nobody else can take that from you. Uh, trademark protection. Um, that's probably not as, as widely known in medical devices, although I do know some of my competitors. Uh, we were competing against Medtronic at one time, and there was a device they used for beating heart surgery called an octopus. They named it octopus and trademarked it. And the surgeons would say, bring me the octopus, not bring me our device. And so the nurse would go on the shelf and take our competitors off and not take ours off. So there is some advantage to that. And the third way <clears throat> is via pack protection. And that's very complex, and I'm sure it'll be covered in some detail further downstream. But the thing to know about that is, uh, is it's very expensive. It's twenty to thirty thousand dollars per patent, and in most instances, you want to surround your idea with patents or claims because a single patent can easily be designed around with a good engineer 
or I guess you could say bad engineer because he's trying to work his way around it. And also, you have to usually, typically, if you're trying to raise money, you have to get what's called freedom to operate. So if you have an idea and you want to go patent it, you have to make sure that nobody else has already patented or it is in that space. And those, those can run as high as $100,000. So I guess my, what I take away from this is you can do a lot of this work yourself. You can go on, there's a number of search websites, including uh, USB, TCA, the US Trade um, Mark and Patent Office, which is very good. It's actually a pretty good search engine. There's a couple other ones that do a good job. So my recommendation to anybody is, you know, be IP savvy and be and do your diligence yourself. And it's it's not I don't think I don't think these people necessarily start this with that in mind. I think some do, but I think it becomes sort of an organically built system that happens. You know, you and again the context build up and say, you know, at some point, maybe we should decide to make some money off of this. It would be a good idea. And that's where this guy comes in. Anybody familiar with the MakerBot? Uh, so this is Bree Pettis. You can look at videos of him from like 10 years ago. Himself and another guy dressed up as pirates on YouTube talking about the Arduino. You know, they're, you know, they're, just, they're just young guys having a lot of fun with this new technology that's out there. But he's from Brooklyn. And they set up in some garage in Brooklyn, and they say, you know, the 3D printers are kind of cool. They were just brand new. And this goes into, I haven't investigated the full patent issue there, but this company, Stratus, <coughs> that makes the main 3D printers. I don't know what patents they had and how long they'd extended, but nonetheless, they're just like, let's make our thing. They call it the thing o -mat the thing matic and it was all open source. And they published all, the, all their materials, all the code, and they said, well, yeah, but we, we have access to a laser cutter. We'll make the kits for you and put it all together. And, you know, we'll make a minimal profit out of that. And it costs $2,000 versus a lot of equivalent. 30 dollars yeah. yeah. But then they go through open source one, open source two, open source three, and eventually probably got married, got a few more gray hairs, and said, you know, eventually I guess we should make some money off of this. So there was this bit of friction here where they closed source some of it. And he just said, so the replicator, when I found me the replicator, let's make it our own company. So you can read more about you know how the split happens. But I was like, I was like, oh that's cool. And he made his own thing. And then August 15, 2013, they got brought by Stratasys for three hundred million dollars. I'm like, that's not a bad return on investment for a couple of years worth of really hard work. You made the comment there. Not taking, not getting paid not getting paid all the time. Entrepreneurship is not something you can start when you have the wife or the husband, the two and a half kids, the one and the third dog, and the white picket fence to pay for. It's gotta be done early when you're willing to live off of ramen noodles in a crappy apartment and not own anything, that you don't care about that because you're spending all your time chasing something, right? And this was a cool little company I just ran into them the other day um, here across the way at the uh, the uh, the Raytheon. Raytheon. So they just three guys, and they figured out a way of projecting a globe on you know image of the planet on the inside of a globe. It's kind of mirrored, frosted, and it's a very niche market. They're selling schools in a few other locations, but I thought that was kind of cool. And this is a kid to watch. Right? Super awesome Sylvia. Um, she is kind of all over the place. But again, the type of personality. She's, a, she's young, but she just, I mean, she's probably wicked smart, so you know, that, that, that doesn't hurt. But um, she's got her own maker show. Uh, she worked with some grown-ups on making a watercolor bot, all based upon the Arduino stuff. She's been at the White House, she's been, you know. So definitely a self-promoting, Person, but I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to do that. You're all students here, right? so when the professor says any questions, and you all sit there staring at him, that's not the entrepreneur. Right? The the entrepreneur is the person who gets themselves noticed, not the pain in the neck in the class. You always have the student that interrupts the professor every 15 minutes, but you sit there and you say any questions. You say, well, there's. There's a nugget here that he's not explaining properly, or I need to know a little more about. So he asked that that one very very cool question, or 
or are, is there any questions? You know, the professor's begging for someone. He's tired of talking for the, for, I've talked for the last 45 minutes. Did anybody say anything else to me? Yeah, you start the conversation going. Those are the people, if you're not that person, talking to the guy in the back there, okay. But if you're not that person, you want to keep your eyes out to the person that does make that. And after class, that's the person you want to talk to. That's the person who has the networking ability out there. And I think those are the people that you want to do. I mean, my wife always says, how, do you, how can you go and talk for four hours or three hours? I said, I don't know. I don't know how I do it. But I'm, but I'm an introvert most of the time. It's, it's actually weird to say, but like, you know, I need that downtime to get out of, to get out of stuff. Whereas my brother is the exact opposite. He might be very quiet in a certain situation, but he needs people around him all the time. And he's more of the entrepreneurial type thing. So you, you, but it takes all different types of people. I'm not sure if that was my last slide. Yeah, no, this is, this is the last slide. Can I just make a comment on sure. that? Sure. So my experience has been, so when I was in engineering school here, I'd go into class and sit in the back of the room because I was such an introvert and I didn't want to interact with anybody or the teacher. And it's just the way I grew up. And what I learned over the years was is you can change that behavior. You can be much more outgoing. You just got to make an effort. You try to find out what the person you're talking to wants as opposed to what you want. And really say, you know, what are you working on? Uh, do you have a team put together? And those kind of things. And you got to force yourself to do it. But I, I think it's something you should all think about and do. And I know a lot of engineers are, are, are introverts. So it's very common when you go to a crowd of networking and it's all engineers. It's, it's kind of painful at times. But you got to work at it keep working at it. And what you find over time is you get pretty good at it. Don't you know what the ex how do you tell it? It's how do you tell the ex the extroverted engineer? He's looking at your shoes, not his own. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an important point, though, and um, I, I, I get, I'm a pretty good schmoozer these days, you know, out of my job. But I wasn't always. But there were things I did to practice. So, for example, one thing you should all do. He has one tip, right? You want to make an impression. You go to an event. Come up with just one question. It doesn't have to be the best question in the world, but just a question. Listen to what the person's saying and think of one question that makes sense. And that's just one way to break the ice. Uh, the other thing I would do is when I collected business cards, I would save them. And the next time I went to an event, I would look through the list. Mm -hmm. So I would, because oftentimes you'll run into the same people and it's hard to remember. But if you have the business cards or you write down, just a little simple thing. And, and those little networking tips will help you to develop that personality that will allow you to ask somebody for a million dollars or five million dollars, which I did this summer. So but you also become the person you're sitting in a talk, right? Happens all the time. We have uh, speakers that'll come to the engineering school. We have people who pick speakers that come to the business school. And they're all sitting there, a hundred students. Any questions? You know, you don't want to be the person to ask the same question all the time, but during the course of a talk, there had to be something that seemed a little bit interesting. 